Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about occupations that your ancestors may have engaged in. If you watched the final episode of the season of Who Do You Think You Are this week, you know that Jim Parsons spent quite a bit of time understanding the occupations of his ancestors. And that tells a really rich story. It helps us understand them and their lives better, um, the world that they lived in, and maybe some of those traits that they may have passed on to us. So we're going to cover... Um, how to discover what your ancestor did for a living, and then how to discover what that means um, and where you can record that to tell the story. So let's dive in. Let's talk first about where you're going to find um, the information about your ancestor's occupations. Of course, the easiest place to locate that information is going to be on census records. Starting in 1850, those census records recorded exactly what that person did for employment. Um, of course, the 1940 census is the most recent census that's available here in the United States, and it not only lists occupation, and industry that the person worked in. But if you pay really close attention to those columns on the right hand side of that image, it will also list how many hours they worked the last week of March. So you get a sense of, you know, were they working 40 hours a week, 60 hours a week, 20 hours a week. Um, it also, to the right of the occupation, lists how many weeks they worked the previous year which is really important because um, they were just coming, um, you know, they were in the depression and not everybody was working full time. Some people were um, itinerant workers. Some people, um, you know, jobs were just really unstable at the time. And so that gives you an idea for what they might have gone through during that time period. And then just to the right of that on the census, of course, is the information about what their income was for 1939. So, Census records not only list occupation, but sometimes some really rich information around that occupation. Of course, 1850, 60, 70, 80, those list just an occupation. Starting in 1900, um, it also lists uh, an industry or a business that they were engaged in. So they weren't just a farmer, they were... Um, you know, maybe they owned the farm or they worked for a specific company. We'll see an example, actually a couple of examples of that a little bit later. So um, a few other things to pay attention to on those census records. Did they start working young? And, and by young, I mean, I have people in my family tree who, um, you know, starting when they were 10, 11, 12 years old, it lists that they're in school, but that they also are a farm laborer. Um, presumably working on their home farm for their father. Um, I have some children who are listed as coal miners. There are other children um, who are, I have a young woman, 14 years old, listed as an apprentice to a dressmaker. So look at that. That tells you a little something about them. So pay attention not just to what their occupation is, but how old they are when they start working. And then follow that work history through the years. Uh, did they completely change occupations at the time? Now that might be a clue that you're following the wrong person. Um, one of the benefits of, an, of following occupations is that it oftentimes can help you sort out people with the same name, especially, like I have families who live in small communities where, you know, three of the first cousins are all named the same thing. And two of them married women with the same first name, and they were all born within a year of each other. And so sorting out those families becomes really difficult until you realize that one of those men um, actually became the town blacksmith. And so, because you know, if I can follow his occupation, I know which one he is, as opposed to, you know, the, the other two who were farmers. So follow that work history through their life, um, not just to separate people, but also to see how they evolve. You know, do they move up in the ranks of a particular career? Um, do they change career paths partway through their life? Uh, do they, you know, do they start out in a career and then go back to farming? Do they start in farming and then go the other direction? Just a really interesting story to be told just following their work history. Also, when you're looking at census records, pay attention to the occupations of the neighbors. That tells a story as well. 
Um, I have one uh, great, so many great uncles, um, and he was the town physician. And so that told me a little something about him as I looked at the town and realized there was no other physician in the town and, you know, started to realize what that meant um, about how people probably relied on him in this particular community. There are others where, um, you know, I have cousins who are coal miners and I look at their census pages and everybody else for pages before and after are also listed as coal miners. And so that, again, that tells you a little something about the community that they're living in and the role that they may have played in that community. So look at that. Other places to find occupations. City directories are excellent, excellent, excellent resources for this. Um, sometimes those occupations are listed as um, abbreviations. So always, if, you, if you're not sure what it means when you have a little um, abbreviation after their name, always go back to the first few pages of the directory. Sometimes it's, you know, 20 or 25 pages in, but go back to the beginning of the directory and look for the um, key to those abbreviations, and you might discover some really cool things about your ancestor, what they did for a living. Um, always pay attention on the city directories to whether it's listed, um, their work address or their home address is listed. Sometimes what you'll discover, especially in larger cities, is that their home address and their work address are the same. So if your ancestor was a grocer or some kind of a shopkeeper or um, some kind of a tradesman, sometimes their shop would be downstairs and their living quarters would be um, over the store. And so city directories are really rich for helping to identify that occupation and their living circumstances, which again, tells a story in and of itself. Now, obituaries are, are rich sources for um, information about occupation and work history. Uh, oftentimes, it'll list who they worked for, not just what they did for a living. Um, sometimes, you know, I've seen things where it lists um, that, you know, what their specialty was or, you know, what they loved about their occupation and what some of their other affiliations were. So we know that a lot of people um, who are engaged in certain occupations are part of a union or part of some kind of a fraternal order. And so uh, you'll find that kind of information often in obituaries as well. And then um, the last place to look for occupational information is in employment records. Now, usually you will be following clues from census records um, that will lead you to some of these other things, but sometimes you start here and work your way back the other direction. Um, so those employment records are going to be a really rich resource as well. Now, on Ancestry.com, we do have some employment records. Um, I will show you where to find those, but in some cases you actually have to go to the organization or the union or um, a local archive or museum or library to get those employment records. Like I said, we do have some on Ancestry.com, and so let me just show you where to find those. If you've spent some time with me, you know how much I love the card catalog, and sometimes I just come into the card catalog and type random words into the title or keyword field just to see what comes up. Ancestry.com has more than 31,000 databases on our website, and sometimes you just you, you need to know what exists, and so it's fun to kind of play with the card catalog and see what comes up. So to prepare for this, um, I pretended that I didn't know anything about the employment records we had on our website and just started typing in some words to see what would come up. So for those of you who haven't used the card catalog, you're going to find it under search. Just hover over that search button there. Card catalog is the very bottom option. You click on that. It brings you to this page. Now, I tried, I tried a couple of things, and so I'm just going to walk you through exactly what I did. I typed the word occupation into the um, title field here in the card catalog, clicked search and it brought up 15 um, different databases. In this case, it's specific directories, like this is a directory of Lancaster County um, listing the adult males and heads of families with their occupations. That's the title of that particular book. Um, histories of, of places, genealogies of places. Um, so sometimes occupation doesn't mean employment, sometimes it means um, like a territory or places being occupied by another people, but it does kind of give you an overview of what's available, and it's kind of a fun way to play with the card catalog. Um, the next word that I typed in was the word employment, and so I went in here and typed in employment. We have five databases, and here this is kind of interesting. So we have a collection of more than two million railway employment records from 1833 to 1956 for the United Kingdom. 
We have uh, California Railroad employment records from 1862 to 1937, and there are 3.2 million of those. Um, it looks like we've got some um, property and employment correspondence from Canada, some New South Wales, Australia registers of police employment, um, and then some Children's Employment Commission records. Now, anytime you find a database that you are interested in, I hope that what you do is you click on it and then scroll down past that search box to read that source information. In this case, these California Railroad employment records were um, an acquisition that we got in an agreement with the California State Railroad Museum Library. Now you know that there is such a thing. <laughs> and if what you're looking for is not in this particular database, these are the people you would contact to maybe find more information. Um, this particular collection was indexed by our Ancestry World Archives project contributors. Anything indexed by that community means it's free. So this is a free database on Ancestry.com. You do not have to have a subscription uh, in order to access it or to search it. If we scroll down just a little bit past that source information, you're going to see um, a, what we call our database description. It's going to tell you exactly what's included in this database. In this case, it's pay lists, so payroll information, blacklists, which I think is really interesting, um, men who were or people who were blacklisted from working on the railroad for whatever reason, and that's just fascinating to me. Um, you might find something you didn't want to find out about your ancestor, but that kind of information always adds color to the story um, and then seniority lists so as people were um, promoted as people were put into management or leadership positions it contains that information as well and then it breaks it down by the specific um, the specific railroad and the years that are covered so if you know what railroad your ancestor worked for then that's even that's even better um, if we scroll down just a little bit here then you'll also see how what has been indexed so what you can expect to find in these records this is just one example of a type of employment record where you can follow your ancestors employment history, what they were paid, when they were paid, if they were promoted, if they were ever blacklisted. Um, and, and like I said, Ancestry.com does not have a lot of employment records, but we do have a couple of really large databases here, particularly for the railroad because the railroad employed so many people. Um, but just knowing that these kinds of records exist motivates me to go find out what other kinds of records might exist out there somewhere and you know start thinking about where they might be held is there a museum is there an archive for the union they may have belonged to is there you know could i just contact the local library where they lived and see if the librarian has some information about what kinds of employment records might exist for my ancestors or my relatives now, sometimes when you're looking at a census record or even sometimes when you're looking at the actual words in a city directory or on an employment record, you don't know what that means. <laughs> um, I've come across things in in um, census records in particular where I have, you know, I can clearly read the word, but the word means nothing to me because I don't know what that means. And so there is a resource available. There's actually um, a website created by the US Gen Web um, volunteers uh, for their whiz kids. Uh, it's on RootsWeb. The URL is there on the bottom of your screen. So if you go to rootsweb.com um, slash tilde USGW kids with a Z at the end and then a slash oldjobs.htm that is a list of all kinds of old jobs and what exactly it means. And let me just show you this because this is one of the coolest resources. I use this quite a bit. So actually, if I go back a page here, here is the page for the US Gen Web's kids on Roots Web. Um, Roots Web, of course, is a free website hosted by Ancestry.com. It's completely run by volunteers. So volunteers um, create these pages and the resources available on them. And then Ancestry.com just hosts this um, on our computer. So that's, um, that's what Roots Web is. Um, US Gen Web's kids, I think, was originally designed for teachers or homeschool parents to have some resources available to them. But if you scroll down just a little bit, they have super cool things on here that I hope you'll go explore. We don't have time to talk about them today. But here um, we have this little link here for old job titles. And you'll see it's just this flat alphabetic listing of old job titles and what exactly that means. So, for example, 
Um, I have an occupation we're going to look at here in just a minute. Um, l written on a census, the, the occupation was written as Drayman, and I didn't know what that meant when I first saw it. And so here I just typed that into my little find. If you don't know how to do a find on any web page, especially one that's got like, I mean, this web page has tons of text, right? And I don't want to read through it all or whatever. So I can just do a, an all or a control F and it brings up this little search box up here. And then I can just type in Drayman and it jumps me directly to where on the page that information exists. So little little tip for you. Um, and so here is a Drayman and it tells me that that occupation is a cart driver. So any occupation you can think of just about is included on this list. Some of them are funny, like a drugger is clearly, you know, a pharmacist. Um, a dripping man, that one was interesting to me, right? Somebody who collects the fat that's cooked during meat um, and then presumably probably resells it um, for for other production things. Lots of different interesting occupations. It's kind of fun just to just to look through this list and, and see what people did for a living, that there are so many different occupations. I think sometimes we think everybody in the world is a farmer because every one of our ancestors are farmers, but not always the case. Anyway, so uh, that again is on rootsweb.com at the US Gen Web Ki Whiz Kids website. They have that list of old jobs where you can go and see if you don't know what a job means. Um, now let's talk about what to do with this information, or at least let me just share with you what I do with this information so that you can start to see some of the possibilities that are available here. I'll walk you through two really quickly, just two um, kind of case studies or examples of occupations that have shown up in my family and how I've recorded this information. Of course, the first step is to record the information. And it's easiest if you record that information as you find it. So as you discover um, this information about your ancestors, record it. I think I've shared this with you, with many of you before, but in my family in particular, the way that I choose to do my um, recording of information is in the notes feature in Family Tree Maker. So here is uh, Osro Abbott, and every time I find a piece of information about him, I insert it wherever it is that it belongs, okay? Um, and you'll notice if you just skim down the left-hand side of this page, all of this information is recorded in chronological order. So it doesn't matter what order I find it in, I always insert it where it belongs. So for example, I haven't yet found a 1930 census for him, and so I can just insert that right there when I do find it. Now the first thing that I found for him was actually his death certificate. And his death certificate lists his, employ his employment or his occupation. He was listed as a tie inspector. Now of course when I say the words tie inspector, because I'm a city girl, automatically what goes into my mind is, um, you know, like somebody who's inspecting bow ties or neckties in some kind of a factory. But he was living in Missouri and so chances are that probably isn't the kind of tie inspector that he was unless there was a necktie factory there. I Certainly worth looking into. And so then as I found other information, I started recording that information here about Osro as I discovered it. So let me just walk you through on a screen that you can probably read a little bit better. Um, I'll walk you through his life and what I discovered about him here in just a minute. The next thing you're going to want to do after you record the information is look at it in the context of the time and place that they are living. So like I mentioned in the case of Osro, he's living in Missouri and he's living in Missouri in the 1910s, 20s and 30s. Um, and so unless I happen to discover that there's a necktie factory in Christian County, that's probably not what he's what he's really doing. So. So think about the context of the time and place that they're living in and what that means for the occupation that they're engaged in. And then ask yourself some questions. I find that I question things a lot. Um, that curiosity gene that I inherited from my, probably from both of my parents, um, has served me really well in family history. If that's not something that comes naturally to you, let me just give you a few examples of ki the kinds of questions that I start to mull over or think about or try to answer. One is, were they educated? Um, on the census, it records whether or not somebody attended school during the year. And so you can sometimes start to see if they were, you know, a later teenager and they were still in school, or did they, did they attend college? Um, or did they only have the opportunity to go to school for a couple of years as a child? 
that will teach you something about um, not just them and their culture and their environment and the choices that they had to make, but also it will teach you something about what they may have chosen to do later in life. Um, the occupations might be limited to them if they weren't educated, or even if they were educated, they may have still made choices to engage in, um, you know, in some kind of manual labor occupation. Just a question to ask. What was the economic situation of the of the society at the time? I mentioned earlier the Great Depression. Uh, being aware that there was a depression in the 1930s and that that forced a lot of people who had been professionals into um, manual labor positions because those professional jobs um, in some circumstances went away. That's important to understand. Uh, there are little depressions and recessions that occur um, all the time and sometimes they hit different kinds of communities differently you know is there a factory that closes down or opens up um, is, is that maybe why your ancestor moved to a specific location so start to pay attention to some of those things um, become a little bit of a student of some of the history of the times and places in which your ancestors live Pay attention to what's going on with other members of the household. Uh, are other members of the household working? Uh, you know, is it just the head of the household that's working or, you know, are all seven of the children also working? If they all have listed occupations, that may tell you a little something about the economic situation of the particular family. In the case of, of one of my great-grandmothers, um, she actually moved, picked up her whole life, had been in Ohio, picked up and moved to Louisiana when her son left his wife with four small children. Um, she, in a very Ruth and Naomi situation in reverse, went to Louisiana with her daughter-in-law and her four grandchildren, and she worked until she was in her 70s to help support that family. So not only was the mother of the household who never remarried, uh, the single mother working to support her young daughters, but the grandmother also worked until late in life to help support that family. That's the kind of things you can learn just by paying attention to who else in the household is working and, and what's going on. And then I talked, I mentioned just briefly earlier, was there a predominant community occupation? You know, is everybody living in this town a coal miner? Uh, is everybody living in this town a farmer? Is everybody living in this town engaged in, you know, what are they doing? Look at, if, you're, if your family lives in a big city, Chicago or New York, look at what's going on in their block. Um, you know, is the grocer living next door to the butcher living next door to the dressmaker living next door? You know, you can start to construct an idea of what their little community or their neighborhood looked like even in a big city. So ask, those are just some of the questions that I ask, but those are some questions that can start to help you understand um, the context of, of where and what your, your ancestor was doing for a living. So in our last few minutes, let me just look at, um, we'll look at Osro Abbott, and then if we have time, we'll look at uh, my great-grandfather as well. So Osro Abbott, as I said, I recorded this information in the census, um, from the census into the notes in Family Tree Maker, and here I've just extracted what I discovered from that. I mentioned that I found that death certificate last, and he listed his, his occupation as a tie inspector. I then able, was able to actually go back and find the 1900 census. He's listed as a day laborer. In the 1910 census, he's listed as a drayman. That's that cart um, driver. And it says in the, in the industry column, it says that he's hauling something. I have yet to be able to interpret that. I've had a few people look at it. I'm, I'm assuming it's some kind of a local crop. Still haven't been able to figure it out. Um, and then in the 1920 census, he's listed as a tie inspector. And then in that, in that industry or business column, it just lists the word Frisco. Now, Frisco, um, I'm going to hope and earn, assume is the company that he's working for rather than just the business that he's working in. Um, and so here this just gives me some information, but then maybe I need to go out to Google to find more information. So I just Googled Frisco Tie Inspector and it brought up a whole bunch of information. And as some of you have probably already guessed or suspected, he actually worked for the St. Louis to San Francisco Railroad. And that um, was often called the Frisco um, Railway at the time. Here you can see Frisco.org actually has 
a website that gives me more information about the Frisco lines and that particular company. And so I could come on here and there's forums and a blog and I can maybe ask information about um, you know where the employment records are for this particular company. In this case, if I look over here, and I don't know if you can see this, I'll make it just a little bit bigger there. If I come over here on this Frisco website, there are links to the Springfield Library and the St. Louis Museum of Transportation, as well as the Fort Smith Trolley Museum and the Museum of the American Railroad, right? Like all these different links to library collections and archives and museums that might have additional information about the Frisco Railroad and maybe even uh, employment records or further information about this particular relative of mine. The next thing I did after I figured out that Frisco meant the Frisco Railroad was I googled um, tie, railroad tie inspector because that's actually what he did. He was a tie inspector and the ties he was inspecting were railroad ties. Um, I had to scroll down a little bit. Um, there were some images here of um, what a railroad tie inspector, how they work today with a big old pickup, um, you know, just some random photos of some railroads but not really a lot of information until I came across this link here for the main memory network and it says Railroad Tie Inspectors Kit. And so I clicked on that link and it just takes me to this little website um, put together. It looks, it's the main memory network and it's the Oakfield Historical Society that put together or contributed this image. And if I read the ins the hello, the, the caption here on this image, it says that this is a railroad tie inspector's kit from about 1920. So even though it's from Maine, uh, it's from the right time period and the right occupation that this relative of mine was, um, was engaged in. And so here is a picture, an image of a railroad tie inspector's kit. And I love this because it just helps me understand a little bit more. These are the kinds of tools that he worked with uh, every day in that occupation. And it's an occupation that he was engaged in for at least 14 years that I have record of and maybe longer. And so it just helps me understand a little bit better. I could do some more digging uh, into uh, Google if I wanted to, to figure out more about him. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that information and I'm actually going to go enter it into the notes in Family Tree Maker. What I discovered about the Frisco Railroad, what I discovered about what a tie inspector does. Uh, and that records the story. It tells the story of what he did for a living. And, you know, if I know we can't put our emotions and circumstances onto our ancestors, but I know how important my occupation is to me and what an important part of my life it is. If nothing else, it's certainly something that they spent hours a day doing. And so recording that information, I think, is really, really important. Let me just show you one more quick example. Um, again, from my family, this is my great grandfather. If I come here to his information, um, here he is, cute man. Um, he apparently was super short. <laughs> My grandmother uh, remembers him and, and talks about him. He, uh, he was the president of a printing company in Ohio, and I actually discovered that in the 1900 census. He was the president of automatic, the automatic printing company at the age of 35 in Cincinnati, Ohio. He actually um, divorced his wife, left her and, and his two children, and moved out to Hollywood, California in its beginning years, in the early years of, of that. And so then in the 1920 census, he's just listed as a printer, which may seem a little bit um, innocuous or not as, as grandiose as being the president of a printing company, but um, there's a story here. And then in the 1930 census, his occupation is listed as a printing supplier. And again, kind of engaged in the same occupation throughout his life. And then in the 1940 census, he's listed as the, propri or the proprietor of a printing supplier. So he's not just a printing supplier um, or you know, working in a printing company. He owns the printing company. 
And so all of that information leads us to start to look for what printing supply companies existed in Los Angeles, Hollywood, Beverly Hills area where he was living between 1920 when he's first listed in Hollywood as a printer in, until 1940. And so we were able to discover that there was actually a company called Cowan Printing. And Cowan Printing uh, was still in existence in the 1960s, um, long after my great-grandfather died. It was not still in the family, but it was still, the company still existed. And they had actually written a small uh, marketing brochure for the company that explained the history of the company. And it talked about, um, well, I'll just read it briefly because this is the kind of information that once you start digging, um, sometimes you find little gold nuggets like this. So this says, the 50-year history of a small company is written on these small pages, but we're just as proud as any giant. This is a Western success story. It started some 2000 thousand odd miles away in the small Ohio village of Brownsville. This is where a pioneer saddler and harness maker by the name of Cowan settled and raised his family. A son park was born in 1863. So right there in just the first few opening sentences of this brochure from a company that my great grandfather started, it gives me information about his father. Information that he was a saddler and a harness maker, that he settled in Brownsville and raised his family there. Um, it goes on to say that at the age of 17, Park apprenticed himself as a printer. Having learned his chosen profession well in 1908, he moved to the far west. For the next eight years, he was superintendent of George Rice and Sons Los Angeles Printers, founded in 1879. By coincidence, almost the same time that young Park decided to enter printing. And then it just goes on to talk about how he started his business in his home, how he developed different kinds of press and rollers, how he um, worked with different um, printers. He exhibited at the at the International Expo in San Francisco in 1915. Lots of just different information about the company, as well as about my great-grandfather and the information that he um that he built in this company. And then it just closes with this, Park Williams died in 1950 at the age of seven, 87. He devoted 70 years of his life to the graphic arts industry. He amassed no great business and no great wealth. He did amass something of far greater value to him, friendship across the country and a reputation for the merit of his products. So for me, of course, that is a beautiful thing to be able to read that information about my great grandfather and the business he built. But all of that came from just digging into the, the employment information that was listed on a census. He's listed as a printer. He's listed as a printing supplier. He's listed as the proprietor of a printing company. Well, what was that company and where can I find it? Um, that curiosity will lead you to the records. And sometimes you have to dig and make lots of phone calls and make friends with librarians and local archivists because sometimes little gems are buried if not in somebody's attic, um, it, you know, in the genealogy stacks of a local library. That is all I have prepared for you. We went a few minutes over today, but I hope that that just at least expands your mind a little bit about what's possible to discover about your ancestors and what their occupations can tell about them, and then the stories that you can record for future generations about what their occupations meant to their communities and to their families. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.